All right, so let's go on to the skeleton. So let's go to this axial skeleton. So this is what we see with our axial skeleton. So when you have an axis, you think of something central, right? So the, like the earth spins on an axis. So the axial skeleton, this is the very central part of the skeleton. So this is the parts that make up the axial skeleton. And again, it's not just your skull and spinal column. It also includes your ribs and also your sacrum and coccyx as well. So what is the axial skeleton? So, so story time, or let's pretend. You're in your dorm or in your bedroom, and then you wake up, and then, oh shoot, all of a sudden, then the coronavirus mutated, and we finally have our zombie at the top apocalypse to cap off to. So what do you do? How do you kill a zombie? According to Walking Dead, how do you kill a zombie? Well, you use an axe, right? You, one thing you can do is use an axe. So where do you use the axe? You can use the axe on the skull, or you can chop off the spinal column to disable the zombie. And that's why I think it's an axial skeleton. When you use an axe, you're killing a zombie, you're trying to hit its axial skeleton to get, put it down as quick as possible. So how do you kill a vampire as well? Well, the thing is that not this type of vampire, but you're also this type of vampire, Nosferatu. How do you kill that type of vampire? Well, where do you... You can use like things like garlic or holy water or the cross, but what's the typical way you see someone kill a vampire? Yeah, you break their heart, correct. So how do you break the heart? Well, you can use your axe, the axe to open it up, and then you drive a stake past the sternum into his heart. So again, you're going to the axial skeleton. So when you're trying to combat those supernatural baddies, you want to attack their axial skeleton. So again, that central part, that to disable them as quickly as possible. So that's how I know what, what parts are the axial skeleton. So then you have the skull bones and mnemonic time. So, or actually not quite yet. So eight cranial, so cranium, this refers to the part that surrounds the brain. So eight cranial bones protect the brain. And then you have 14 facial, everyone has, knows what the face is. So these protect the facial entrances to the body. So again, you have bones not only for structure, but protection as well. Okay, so then the cranial bones, this is what we have here. And notice all those fossae in the inside of the interior of these cranial bones. And again, you want it smooth because you want your brain to glide against the bone. You don't want it to like rub itself against the bone and have your bone actually be like sandpaper on your brain. So this is the cranium. And remember, the cranium houses that squishy, soft nervous tissue we call brain, your brain. Now your cranial brain, so bones. So what are you after an anatomy exam? Riddle me this. You are probably test off. Now what if I spell it this way? It's not a typo because this is a mnemonic telling you what are your cranial bones. Your parietal, ethmoid, sphenoid, temporal, occipital, and frontal bones. Now you have two pairs, or you have, okay. So I think your lab manual is different from your textbooks. So I think it says like when it talks about paired bones, I think your lab manual talks about two paired frontal bones, but that's when you're developing. Once you're fully a developed adult with the fully form formed cranium, your frontal bones fuse and you just have one frontal bone. So when I'm talking about this, you have two parietal in an adult and two temporal in an adult, but occipital, frontal, ethmoid, and sphenoid, you only have one fully formed bone in adults. Now the frontal bone, this is pretty obvious. Where's the frontal bone? It's up front and center. Yeah, frontal bone. So your forehead, that's your frontal bone. That's, <laughs> knock that one out. And then articulation. So articulation, this is kind of interesting. So when you hear the term articulate, you probably think of someone who is very well-spoken, very eloquent, they very have the gift of gab. But articulation on another side, is in terms of anatomy, it refers to some sort of joint. So when two bones touch, this is what you call articulation. And again, this is a kind of weird term, like articulation. But when you say a bone articulates with something, that means a bone is touching another bone. All right, so then parietal bones. So parietal bones, these again are paired bones. <laughs> So these are paired bones, and again, you have left and right. So again, it's not just one fused bone. You do have a suture here, and we'll get to the sutures later on, probably next week. 
But yeah, parietal bones. So this is probably a new term. So parietal bones, you have it on the sides. So these are the ones on the side and the superior part of your head. So parietal bones, this is the way I like to think of it. Going with our Halloween theme, a parietal bone, when, how does a zombie try to attack your brain? It tries to pry your skull open, right? So when it pries open your skull, it pries open your parietal bones and eats your brain. So that's what I think of it. Parietal, that's kind of the top and sides of your skull. And temporal bones. So temporal, when you rub your temples, where are you rubbing? You're kind of rubbing the sides of your head, right? Again, if you're looking, if you're thinking of dropping out, you're probably rubbing your temporal bones. And don't drop out, don't give up, hang in there, you know you can do it. But temporal bones, you're rubbing your temples, right? The sides of your brain. So again, temporal bones, and you have a pair, again, you have left and right. They're not co connected and fused together. And then the other big bone right here is the occipital bone. So again, frontal in the front, parietal on the top and the sides, and then you have your occipital bone in the back. And what do you have with occipital bone? Another mnemonic I just learned during the summer. So this is an octopus, right? And octopuses don't have cranial bones. They don't have a skeleton like we do. But remember the octopus, they have a really big prominent back of their head, right? So this is where, like, the, so this is the mnemonic. Occipital, think of an octopus with the big back of the head, and it's attaching itself to the back of your head. So the occipital bone, that's the back of your skull right there. And so again, you have temporal bone. So now we're talked about the major cranial bones, but now let's talk about the little markings. Now, do I want you to memorize every single marking on the bones? Um, Focus on the ones I cover in lecture. Not that they're not all important, but I think these are the ones that are easily identifiable. And I'm leaving the finer details for, you, for your TAs if you're taking the lab. So because there's a larger anatomy focus. So here in the temporal bone, hey, that's that passageway we talked about, right? So remember that metis, that external acoustic, acoustic metis. That allows, again, vibrations and air to travel from the external ear and vibrate your tympanic membrane inside your, ear, your skull. And then you have something here. So actually, you can feel it. Feel behind your ear, and you might be able to feel this part right here. It's actually some sort of like this little smooth bump behind your ear. So try to feel back there. So this is why I, this is one of the hardest things about teaching online. It's like, Easier to show this in person, but yeah, try to feel like back here. So you should, in most people, you should be able to feel some sort of bony smooth projection there. So this is what we call our mastoid process. And it's very interesting. So remember like a few lectures back, I said that the old anatomists, they had dirty minds. So the mastoid process, this comes from the Greek word mastoides which means breast shape. They think this looks like a breast. Remember how I said like the, they think all the, the papillary layer of your skin looks like little nipples because Latin papilla is nipple. So they think this looks like breast. I don't know, it's like, okay, whatever. But yeah, that's why they call it the mastoid process. They think is like, <laughs> they think that little part in the back of your ear is shaped like a breast. I know it's very weird. And then what we have here, so hey, we referred to this earlier. So we have that little thing that's shaped like the stylus of a 3DS. So that's the styloid process. So uh, that one I love because it's so easy to identify compared to your mastoid process. Now you can't typically feel this one because it's more, even though it looks like you can from the side, this is where you attach a lot of the inner tendons inside your skull. And also, yeah, actually we'll get cover that when we cover muscular anatomy. But yeah, remember, why do you have all these processes and all these projections? Well, with the mastoid process and the styloid process as examples, remember, when you have some sort of projection, it becomes easy to kind of a rough surface or some sort of projection. It's easy for tissues to grab onto, whereas a smooth surface is more for things to glide against. And then occipital bone. So then again, this is the back of your head. He's resting his hands on his occipital bone. So occipital bone markings, you have the condyle. So this part right here, these are smooth surfaces. They're kind of like knuckles. We're looking at the bottom of a skull right here. And then you also have something called the external occipital protuberance. And remember the tubers, those little bumps, those potato, the tuber-like bumps. 
and then occipital condyles. So these are gliding part. These are very interesting. They're like knuckles. But then here we have the atlas. This is the first cervical vertebrae. But notice that, the, remember, condyles, these are projections. They're like little knuckles. And remember that projections are not only for tissues to grab onto. Sometimes they fit into other bones as well. So with the atlas, what you have are these superior articular facets. So what happens is that the condyle of the occipital, occipital bone, it kind of fits into the facets of an uh, atlas and kind of glides against this. So this allows you to nod your head up and down. When you do that, these condyles are gliding against the facets of your first cervical vertebrae. And then foramen magnum, again, magnum referring to something very big, right? So foramen magnum refers to that big, big hole in the base of your skull. And then you have something called the external occipital protuberance. And if you, some people have more prominent ones than others, but you can feel it in the back of your head. If you feel the center of the back of your head, you might feel a little bump compared to the rest of your skull in the very back. And this is, so this is what you call the external occipital protuberance. But again, it's a bump, right? So that means something attaches to it. So a lot of like connective tissue and muscles, they attach to this oxi ex external occipital protuberance. And this is a more extreme example. This is actually the same guy. I think this was from a plastic surgery journal. But yeah, he has a very prominent external occipital protuberance. But he got plastic surgery. I guess he was kind of like self-conscious of it. So he had that bone shaved down, and now it's all smooth. But yeah, why do I love these? Why do I make a big deal about these landmarks? Not only are they easy to identify, but you can also... You've, the thing is that the real cool thing with exam two, your body's your cheat sheet. So if I see you like kind of looking at your hands like this and feeling the bones of your hands or feeling the back of your head, I'm not going to like make a big deal of it because you're kind of like, this is one of the ways you can learn. A lot of these bones and these bone markings, some of them you can do what we call palpation. You can feel them through your own skin and you can kind of feel the overall shape. Again, you don't have to like cut yourself open. Please don't do that, by the way. But again, this is why I make a big deal. Some of these, you have an entire skeleton inside your body. So why not use it and why not actually use it to kind of get a better idea of where these are. Just don't look at these pictures. This is another study tip. Kind of feel the areas you're working with and kind of get a feel of how the bones are arranged in it. Sometimes muscles are easy to feel, but not all. But bones, some bone markings, yeah, you can definitely feel them compared to other parts.